Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Explore Classroom. I'm so happy that so many folks could join from all across North America. We got some classrooms from Mexico, we got a classroom in Canada, and some in the States. So it's really awesome that you guys can all join today because we've got Paul Salifak, who does great work for us here at National Geographic, but also, I guess, for all of us in general, all of humans. And he's really doing a great job of trying to bring people together through storytelling, stuff that we really like here at National Geographic. For those of you that are watching, on YouTube Live or um, watching the Hangout but are not on screen with us, feel free to ask questions and share your comments using the hashtag Let's Explore on Twitter or on the YouTube Live sidebar and I'll try and loop you into the conversation. Um, once again, thanks for joining and I'll pass it to our host, Joe. All right, thank thanks, you very Jordan. much, Jordan. Uh, my name is Joe Grabowski. Uh, I'll be your host for today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Paul today. We had an amazing hangout with Paul uh, last school year uh, on an earlier part of his journey. But for those who don't know or maybe new today, Paul is a journalist. He's walking out of Ethiopia, uh, started in January 2013, and since then has walked over 6,000 miles. His continuing journey will take him across three continents as he follows the path of our first human ancestors to the southernmost point in South America, likely somewhere in 2020. Over the past year, he's been walking the old Silk Roads, an ancient network of trade routes that were central to commerce and cultural integration of the Asian continent. Along the way, he's been collecting stories about major issues, things like climate change, uh, technology, and he's also seeking the personal, lesser known stories from the individuals he meets along the way. So Paul, it's great to see and hear you today. Oh, great, great to be back, Joe. It's been, what's it been, almost exactly a year or close, something like that? Um, I think we're getting close, probably in about the 10-month range. Yeah, yeah, no, so, you know, just just uh, bearing that in mind, uh, I just want to welcome everybody to the Hangout, and it's great to see so many schools uh, from all over North America. I welcome Canada, welcome the United States. Bienvenidos, amigos de México también. And uh, what I'm going to do is just, I guess, Joe, give you a brief like five minute kind of uh, intro to where I've walked in the last year uh, and uh, and then, you know, raise some of the stories to touch on some of the themes that I've written about. Uh, and then we can, you know, open it up to questions um, as, as there is interest to do that. Um, so again, uh, guys, my name is Paul and I'm, I've been uh, walking uh, through the world since January of 2013. That's probably like half of some of your lifespans. It's the last four years. Um, and the idea is to follow the ancient pathways of the first ancestors who migrated out of the ancestral continent of Africa, where scientists say our species evolved a long time ago, 200,000 years ago. And then about 60 to 80,000 years ago, so our ancestors were hanging out in Africa, they were hunting, they were gathering vegetables, they were uh, evolving as it were, they were uh, you know, inventing innovations in stone tools, uh, language was getting more advanced. Then about 60,000 years ago, 60 to 80,000 years ago, something amazing happened and scientists are still debating what it was, we don't know. But then we just exploded out of the African continent, kind of our homeland, and then colonized the earth. We, we moved across deserts, we moved across mountains, we followed rivers, we followed beaches. And in a very short time, just about 2,500 generations, which sounds like a lot, I know it sounds like a lot, but it's really short in, in the, kind of the evolutionary time span, um, we reached the furthest coastline away from Africa uh, which was the very tip of South America, a place called Tierra del Fuego in uh, Chile and Argentina. And that's where I'm headed. And as Joe mentioned, um, I've covered about 6,000 miles or 10,000 kilometers so far, most of it on foot. I've had to take boats on a couple occasions where there were seas. And I've got a long way to go, guys. I've got another 14,000 miles to go. You know, that's more than 20,000 kilometers. And it's going to probably take me more than my projected time. I expected to reach my finish line in 2020, about three years from now. But truth is, it's probably going to be like another five or six years um, because there are too many interesting stories on the way. So um, I've been walking the last year through uh, Central Asia. And Joe, you should feel free to, to show some of those slides. Um, All right. So just give me a second, Paul. I'm going to load okay. them up. Um, okay. You let me know when you can see my screen. 
and then you can take over. So it should just take okay. a second to load them. Sure. All right. Can you see the slides now? Yeah, I sure can. So you guys, you see that first slide, um, and that's, that's an image of the world um, that shows um, kind of the first migrations across the world. Yeah, that one. And so you can see the red is kind of the oldest part of humankind, um, and that goes back, as I mentioned, to 200,000 years. And uh, you see the arrows start spreading out of Africa about 100,000 years ago. Um, and then some of us migrated um, into Europe. You kind of see that brown area. Um, and then the rest of us kind of moved eastward across Asia. Uh, there was a branch of very adventurous souls who, who took ships or made boats or canoes and, and spread to Australia about 50,000 years ago. And then a large number of us uh, inched over the Siberia steppe, the Siberian tundra, then that's that red arrow at the very top down into North America, right? So that's where you guys are. So the migration kind of went from Africa towards where all of you guys are sitting. And by about 15,000 years ago, uh, people started filling in the American continent. And then my finish line is way down at the bottom at the tip of South America. And I think there's another map, Joe, we can, we can change the slide. So what, how do I know, how do we know that people move this way? And this is my route. Um, uh, because archaeologists, and you guys, you know what archaeologists do, right, guys? Yeah, what do archaeologists do? Uh, sorry, Paul, let me pick a classroom for you. Uh, Mrs. Okay. Duncan's classroom, your mic's on. They make discoveries about human history. That's right. They, they make discoveries of human history by digging up old bones, digging up old artifacts. And those are the guys, those are the scientists, the men and women whose research I'm using to determine my route across the world. So if we can go back to, to, that, to that image, uh, that, that map, uh, Joe, and we'll continue the, the slideshow. I'll show you some pictures from the route so far over the last year. Are the slides back up now, Paul? Um, okay, yeah, now they are. So that, you know, this picture here that, that Joe has up is a picture of DNA. And um, that's the kind of molecule of life uh, that's in all of our cells, or at least most of them, that determines who we are as, as, uh, as people, right? This is the, the kind of the, the genetic blueprint that determines who you are as an individual. Things to a certain degree about your personality, your eye color, um, how tall you are, some of this is determined by DNA. And DNA also provides hints about where we've migrated because in every cell in our body, there are small mutations called gene markers and they help scientists kind of map how our ancestors spread as well. So we can go to the next slide, which I think is uh, we had up earlier, which is the map of my route. And so here I am, you can see there's a little white dot in Central Asia, the Badai Tugai Nature Reserve, Uzbekistan, 2016. This map's a little bit out of date, but not much. Um, that, that marker is more or less where I am now. I'm within about, I don't know, a thousand kilometers of that dot. And so you can see I've got a long way to go. Um, and what I've got to show you is there's, a, there's that red line that goes very straight between Asia and North America. I'll be taking a ship. For those of you who are asking, hey, Paul, you can't walk on water. Of course I can't. So I'll be taking a vessel, a uh, ship across the North Pacific. So a big chunk of this walk, maybe, uh, I don't know, two to three to th even 4,000 kilometers um, will be by ship before walking down the western coast, mostly, of North America. So let's take a noose, another picture. Now, Joe, c can you hear me? Yeah, I've got the next one up, Paul. This, there might just be a little bit of a delay on your end. Okay, gotcha. There's probably a little time lag. So, guys, I'm just going to run you through like 15 photos um, pretty quickly uh, about um, the route. So this, of course, is the beginning. This was back in Ethiopia in 2013, and that's a picture of, of Elema Hassan, my, my Ethiopian walking partner, and our camels uh, who helped us carry water and food across the Ethiopian desert. Uh, next slide. 
And this picture is another subcontinent over. So from Africa, I took a ship to Arabia. And this is in the country of Jordan. And these beautiful mountains are called the Transjordanian Range. And it goes all the way up the Middle East from, from basically northern Saudi Arabia into Jordan. And then this mountain range continues actually all the way into Turkey. Um, and that photo was of my Bedouin walking partner, um, uh, Hamoudi. And he's, as you can tell, he's headed uphill and he's holding on to the tail of the mule. He's getting a little assist from that mule to get uphill. Now, next slide. And guys, I think I have somebody's mic on, so I can't see uh, the screen. So if, if you guys can, can uh, mute your mic so I can get back to the screen, that would be great. Great. Okay, and so this is now another picture. This is um, of my walking partner, Murat Yazar. And again, another, another um, uh, mule shot, you guys will notice, and I'll be happy to take questions. I use cargo animals quite a lot. And this was a, a white mule in Turkey. Her name was Kirkatir. Uh, she was sold to me as a young mule of about four or five years which is kind of a, a healthy young mule that would be maybe 15 in, in human years. But we then discovered after taking her to a veterinarian and, and getting uh, some paperwork done that she was actually over 20 years old. She was a very ancient mule, um, but she did a great job helping us walk all the way through Turkey. And this is Murat is sitting in a field of young wheat and uh, Kirkatir, the mule, is having a great time eating some of the wheat. It's like ice cream to her. The next photo. Uh, this is a little further along after crossing uh, the Caucasus Mountains out of Turkey. Uh, here I'm walking over a probably a three to four hundred year old footbridge built by a vanished empire called the Ottoman Empire. And this is in the country of Azerbaijan. Uh, it's a small country that's next to the Caspian Sea. And uh, it was a wonderful walk through the foothills of some mountains there um, and uh, getting to know the Azeri people. Very, very friendly, hospitable people along the way. This is a picture of some. sometimes what happens, the cost of walking across the world. Sometimes you get blisters, right? These aren't my feet. These are the feet of a guide um, in Central Asia. And uh, we've patched up his feet to help him keep us going. And the next slide. Uh, this is in the country of Kazakhstan. Um, this is a sea cave. Kazakhstan is mainly, it's a big country in Central Asia, and it's mainly steppe. And you guys know what step is, right? It's grasslands. It's kind of cold grasslands. And this was a beautiful view out which to look over these grasslands where sometimes there's even antelope, kind of herds of antelope running across this wild, wild area. Next picture. So the next big obstacle for me and my walking partners was um, the uh, Ustud Plateau. And, and this is kind of a, a big, flat tableland that's about oh, 300 miles across, maybe like 450 kilometers across. Um, and there was very little water. This was summertime. It was like a more than 100 degrees out. That would be, you know, 40 degrees or so uh, uh, centigrade. And it was very hot. And what we did was walk along um, a railroad line. And we used the railroad kind of as a lifeline for resupplying ourselves. And our, at this point, we had a cargo horse and a cargo uh, donkey. And we found a train that was parked, and it had a big water tank. And we asked the engineer of the train, hey, can we, can we get some water out? And he said, go right ahead, including take a shower. So we were using kind of a, a valve to open up the water in the water tanker to wash up in this hot day. Next slide. As, as I walked along the Silk Roads, I started coming into these really old um, cities, these cities that date from the Middle Ages. And this is one of them. This is Kiva. And so you guys understand, you know, the Silk Road, you might have heard about it. It was a big trading route, as Joe said, between Asia and Europe. And it started more or less around Roman times in, in the West. It was about 2,000 years ago, a little more. And very precious um, materials like silk were coming from China to be traded in Europe. And, and the return were things like gold or, or glass made in Venice. Um, and so we had these two civilizations that were kind of connected by trade. And that went on for hundreds and hundreds of years. 
And along the way, these, these caravans, mainly camels and mules carrying this precious cargo, would have stops at major trading cities, uh, you know, hundreds of miles apart, where they would resupply, rest their animals, and sometimes change their loads from one caravan to another. And this is what one of those cities looks like. This is in the country of Uzbekistan. This is the ancient city, uh, Silk Road city of Kiva. Very beautiful, very old. Um, another feature that I ran into in the last year walking through Central Asia was this very antique and very beautiful river called the Amudaria. And it had an old classical name that the old ancient Greeks called Oxus, the Oxus River. It's famous in the region because um, even Alexander the Great, the famous uh, Macedonian conqueror, writes about crossing this river. And there it is today. It's mainly used for agriculture. This, is, this too is in Uzbekistan, and the river irrigates lots of beautiful orchards of apricots and, and fields of melons and fields of, of, of wheat, of rice. Uh, it was like walking through a fruit basket, and it reminded me a little bit about walking through like the Central Valley of California with lots of agriculture. And so my walking partners and I were able to feast off of the various crops uh, that we walked through. We had a great diet of natural fruits and melons and whatnot. Next slide. People ask me, students ask me, Paul, where do you stay at night when you're walking across the world as you walk day after day, week after week, month after month? I try to stay with people, right? The Out of Eden Walk is a project about people mainly. I write about nature. I write about the environment, of course. But the main purpose of the walk is to try to look at life today, human life, uh, through the mirror of deep history of the first ancestors who migrated out of Africa, the people that I'm following. And to do that, of course, I, I have to stay with people. I have to talk to them. I have conversations. And so this is a, this is a couple, again, in Uzbekistan, very friendly. The man was a retired engineer uh, and his wife. And we would walk into a village. Uh, it was getting dark. And then me and my colleagues, I was walking at this time with two Uzbek friends, Aziz and Tolik. And they would kind of go to somebody on the street, kind of the oldest person, right? Somebody who looked like they might have some responsibility and say, hey, you know, is there somebody in town who might be willing to put up us three travelers and our, at this point, we had two, two cargo mule, mules, donkeys, excuse me. And generally, most of the time, people were very friendly and said, hey, you know, come stay at my house. And so these people uh, were very great hosts and they had just helped us uh, uh, put our, our animals into a barn and we were just sharing breakfast with them the next morning. Next slide. You know, one of the amazing things about this walk, uh, you know, think about this, that may not think about it too much if you think about traveling, if you guys take vacations and you travel by airplane, you travel by car, is that one of the things that walking does is that it really puts you in close contact to the surface of the earth, right? You're, you're walking across the earth, and often when you're walking, you're looking down. And what do you find when you're looking down? You find pieces of the past. Guys, our planet is a gigantic archeological site because human beings have been roaming across it for thousands of years. And so through Central Asia, as I walked across the Silk Road, almost every day I stumbled across ancient artifacts dating back anywhere from a few generations to many thousands of years in the past. And this is just one typical example. Here I'm crossing the Kizilkum Desert of Uzbekistan, and it was littered with millions of pieces of old ceramics that probably held water or food or grain, and that one time had been carried on camels across this desert, say back in the Middle Ages. This piece, I would say, probably is not that old. This piece is probably two or 300 years old. Um, and it was just another connection to our common humanity. What connects us to, to each other is often the past. Um, here is a typical scene on a typical day um, of walking um, uh, through uh, these mountains uh, in Uzbekistan. And this is uh, Aziz uh, is in the white shirt. Uh, Tolik is wearing the dark sweater. And those are our two cargo donkeys, Mouse and Haram. Um, who we got very fond of. They became like friends, these two animals. Um, and we're just about, um, we're going to um, head over these mountains, which later on ran into snow. It got quite cold. 
to walk into the next country called Kyrgyzstan. Next slide. So just to wrap up, um, and then I'll open it up for questions from all of you guys. Um, this is a, a photograph of the interior of a mosque um, in um, Samarkand, another, another ancient Silk Road city that goes back hundreds of years. And look at this amazing artwork, guys. This is gold leaf and lapis colored paint um, inside of a mosque in a madrasa. And you guys, I don't know if some of you have heard of the word madrasa, but that's in, that's in a, a, a kind of a religious school. So this is what the ceiling of a, of a, of a school looked like probably about 400 years ago. It was pretty fancy. And that tells you how rich these societies were due to international connections, due to trade, but not only to trade. And we could talk about this. This is important in our day, today, in our lives. But the exchange of ideas, right? One of the great things about the Silk Road is that ideas moved along it as well as things like gold or silk or glass um, or, or other precious luxury items, ideas moved along it, religions moved along it, Buddhism moved along the Silk Road. Inventions like paper from China moved along the Silk Road that allowed societies to begin recording things like history, that allowed cultures to begin organizing empires. Ideas about better technology, ideas about philosophy and art, this is a beautiful piece of art. Um, this art just amazed Western travelers like the Marco Polo family, uh, who you may have heard of, who migrated along the route for trade. They looked at this and said, wow, we don't have anything like this in Europe. It was just uh, amazing to them. Next image. And this is how we stay connected, right? So we can, we can either leave that up there uh, if you wish, Joe, but uh, let's get on with uh, questions um, about... Uh, the Silk Road or anything to do with what it's like to walk across the world for, for several years at a time. All right. Well, Paul, thank you so much. I'll put that up at the end again so that anybody who wants to jot down the ways to stay connected uh, can do so. But, you know, I love following your journey. Um, I love listening to you talk about the places you've been and the stories and the connections you've made. So thank you so much for sharing and updating us uh, from the past few months. All right, well, let's meet some classrooms. So let me just pull up my list here. There we go. Our first group is Mrs. Duncans. They're joining us from Upper Marlboro in Maryland, and they're a grade six to eight group. And I'll turn your microphone on. Great. Hi, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Do you limit yourself to a minimum or maximum of, of miles a day? Okay, good question. Uh, the question is, do, do I have a kind of a goal for how many miles I walk every day? You know, the answer, it, it changed. There's no solid uh, kind of a mile marker that I'm going for. Uh, if, I, if I'm trying to travel quickly, let's say, remember those pictures of the, of the desert I showed you? If I'm trying to get across that kind of an obstacle quickly, I move as fast as I can. And on a typical day, uh, crossing the Kizil Kum, we covered about 20 miles, right? So we, that's pretty far to walk in a single day. Um, you know, in a car, that would take you 20 minutes on a highway. But walking as fast as you can without taking too many breaks, that will take you 10 hours or so. Um, it's, it's pretty far. Um, when I'm walking where people are, villages or towns, or they're just interesting stories, I'm stopping to have conversations, the mileage drops way down. Uh, to as little as two or three miles in a day. And that's okay, because what I have to remind you and my readers about is that the story is about people and storytelling. And I don't want to walk past, say, if there's a, if there's a uh, like some man who invented a strange new generator out of, a, out of a car engine, for example, somebody who's using their head really well, uh, uh, kind of a local inventor. I might want to spend the afternoon with that man in which case we tie up the donkeys and, and just kind of sit and talk with him and I take notes. So it's all over the place. Um, it's taking, that's one reason why the walk, uh, the Out of Eden walk is taking longer than I expected. I'm just running into too many great stories every day. All right, great question. So we're gonna visit each classroom once first and then we'll swing back uh, for some questions afterwards. But let's great. visit Mr. D'Amato's group. Let me 
turn your microphone on. They are in Cranford, New Jersey, and they are a grade five classroom. Great. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Ethan, go ahead, hey. buddy. Hey, nice hat. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever explored or have you ever explored any of the ancient cities? And which one was your favorite? Yeah, good question. Yeah, it's one of the great things. I wish I could take you guys, I wish I could scoop you up and just bring you with me. Because walking through some of these ancient cities, I know you would love it. I mean, these are really cool cities that have narrow alleyways that are really crooked, like in the movies. Some of the alleyways are just wide enough to get a horse through, and then the walls go up quite high. And the reason why they did that, they were smart. They were worried about invaders coming in. Sometimes they had problems with neighboring tribes or neighboring empires. And so they intentionally made these narrow alleyways in these trading cities so that people would have to go through one at a time. And they couldn't attack them quickly in big groups. It would slow people down. And then they could also throw things down on their head, too. So it's kind of a, you know, a little bit of evidence of violence in the past. But by and large, once you go through these narrow alleyways, they often open up into these big squares, these big open plazas, which are just fantastic. Because that's where the architecture, kind of the jewel architecture of these, of these city empires was built. And it's not just ancient mosques, but also palace complexes, um, madrasas, really beautiful architecture. So imagine if you guys were with me and we're walking through these crooked old alleyways with brick walls that go up. And then all of a sudden, like a door, the alley opens into an open space that's probably 10 football fields big. And I'm not kidding. They are huge. And around them are these big temples and big towers that go soaring into the blue sky. It really takes your breath away. It's a real, a real treat after you've been walking through deserts uh, to come to a city like that. Good question. Uh, sounds absolutely amazing, Paul. I wish you could take us with you, but you're doing a pretty good job with all your connections <laughs> and stories you're sharing. So I guess that's Great. something. <laughs> all right. Our next group is joining us. Let's see. Mrs. Vanderbilt and Mrs. Benton. They are in Santa Fe, New Mexico. There's some grade 8s and grade 10s, I believe. Yep, and we have some ninth graders as well. And Faith has a question for you, Paul. Great. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Um, have you noticed any silent effects of climate change on rural communities that aren't known to the rest of the world? Mm -hmm. Really excellent question. Climate change question. Yeah, you know, silent and not so silent, right? The, the climate change stories that I read about when I get online and I look through the news I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but most of them are like um, island nations or, or cities or populations that are along coastlines that are worried about changes in sea level because as the sea level goes up, their cities or their fields might be flooded. And there are, there are nations um, in the South Pacific and Micronesia that may completely disappear if this trend continues. There are countries like Bangladesh, which is very low-lying and at the mouth of a big river in Asia, that if the water continues to rise, they'll lose their crop lands and they'll have trouble feeding themselves. So these are the familiar stories, kind of the easy ones that reporters go to because they're so dramatic. But I'll give you an example of a story that, that hasn't been covered that has the opposite kind of uh, effect. And that is so much rain that this desert blooms green in a way that the local um, nomads, the local shepherds who, who used to you know, run their sheep out onto these very barren deserts in ways that they don't even remember. Their, their grandfathers, their grandmothers don't remember it being this rainy, this green. And the, the desert has blossomed with, with flowers and plants that these, and this is in Kazakhstan and Central Asia, that they don't even have names for. I would say, what's the name of this? And they would say, we don't know. We've never seen it before. And we've been here our entire lives and our parents have been here their entire lives and our grandparents have been here, you know, uh, pasturing sheep their entire lives. And, and there's so much, there was so much rain the year that I walked through, which was last year that um, it looked like Switzerland guys. It looked like, instead of looking like the dry field South of Santa Fe, right. Instead of looking like the kind of the, the high uh, um, tan and uh, um, bronze colored uh, high desert, it looked 
vibrant green and it was astonishing. So climate change cuts in many different directions and um, all of it has got people talking. Whenever I talk to strangers along this route, the last four years, changing weather is a constant. It always comes up. You know, people talk about certain things all the time. They talk about their jobs, they talk about their families, but they are now, and since I've been walking, I've been hearing a constant conversation about changing weather. It's real and it's happening. Good question. All right, before we jump to our next class, um, the group in New Mexico, I was just noticing that you have me locked on your screen and I'm sure you're probably tired of looking at me. So if you do want to unlock that, you can just click on the little box with me at the bottom and that should unlock your screen and let it jump between who's talking if you want to uh, unlock your screen. But let's jump to our next group. We have Hi, everyone, that announcement announcements going on in my room. But Miss Reed's group in Charlottesville, Virginia, a middle school group. Your microphone is on. Go ahead with the question. Go ahead, Alex. Has your world Hi, guys. changed? Has your world view changed since you started your trip? Yeah, that's a big yeah, that's question. A big question. Um, I'll try to I'll try to keep the answer reasonably short because it has yeah in very complicated ways on many levels, both intellectually and even emotionally. What walking has done for me as a storyteller is at, it, it has shown me now more than ever um, how interconnected our lives are. Because imagine you guys are reporters. Imagine every one of you around the table is a young reporter and your editor gives you an assignment and says, guys, go cover wh what I just talked about, climate change in Kazakhstan. We hear these reports that the steppe, the dry grasslands are turning amazingly green and we want you to fly there and interview people about how that's changing their lives. Now imagine, if you did that assignment by, by jet, you got on a plane wherever you are and you flew to Central Asia, it took maybe a day and a half, and then you rent a car and then you go spend two days talking to people, then you get back in a jet and you fly back home and you write your story. Imagine that experience and contrast it with my method of walked journalism, of slow journalism, where I have for months and even years walked towards this story in Kazakhstan, and this is important, without even knowing it, without even knowing that this story was waiting for me there, I walk into this climate change story. What I'm able to, to apply to my version of what I write about as a reporter, as a journalist about climate change, is everything that I've seen about climate change for the last four years as I'm inching like a snail towards Kazakhstan. I'm able to draw on a depth of storytelling. I'm able to, I'm able to draw on a width of, of experience to throw all of this into my cooking pot as a storyteller, and I think tell a much more um, nuanced, deeper, more meaningful story. So this journey has changed my life in the sense that it's, it's helped me see and appreciate these very complicated connections between our lives in this global world today. Um, we, our lives, whether you realize it or not, whether you like it or not, your life is very strongly connected to almost everybody else's on the planet. Our economies are intertwined, our political fates are intertwined, and now climate, the most fundamental tenet of daily life, is also connecting us. So what you do affects somebody across the world and what they do affects you. That's what this project has done for me. That's how it's changed my view of the world. The second thing that's changed by walking is it's kind of slowed down my thinking in a Stone Age way so that as I inch through continents day after day, the change that I see is very gradual, right? I don't kind of drive between a city center and a farm in 20 minutes. It takes me days to cover that territory. And what that has done, it's kind of switched a channel in my head where I see the world moving very slowly I see sunsets, I see sunrises, I sit under a tree, I listen to birds, or I watch a highway in the distance. And what this kind of slow thinking has done for me is it's kind of made me look at our, our manufactured world, at our cities, at our highways, as very temporary objects. I look at what looks like something very permanent, like these classrooms that you're sitting in, that you think, you know, you just assume Kids will be sitting in them 10 years from now, 20 years from now, maybe 100 years from now. 
even after 200 years from now, what we're, our life and what the, the room that you're sitting in and the room that I'm sitting in is very temporary. All of these cities will eventually be transformed by nature. Um, and so this walk has given me kind of a long view over the horizon to know and to, to live every day to the fullest because the world is changing itself constantly. What we think is permanent is very temporary. That's such a great point, Paul, and a great question uh, from our group. Um, before we go to the next class, though, uh, I'm going to grab a Twitter question. This is a neat question. It's from uh, someone named Mike, and they're wondering, um, have you ever had a female guide, and if not, why not? That's a really excellent question. Yeah, you know, I've written about this, Mike, and, and um, I'm going to continue writing about it. One of, the, one of the great, you know, the, uh, walking across the world, you can expect you'll, run, you'll find barriers and obstacles, and there's some obvious ones, like, like um, seashores or like, you know, mountain ranges, or in some cases, wars, right? The Syrian war in the Middle East stopped me and I had to walk around it. But one of the invisible barriers that's been very profound on my project is the gender barrier, because I'm walking through rural societies, often that are very conservative, and I've often been walking for a large time also through Islamic societies, Muslim cultures, where there's a wider gap between men and women and in some other places. And so for me to get access to women's lives, for me to kind of get inside of women's heads and tell their stories is more difficult than with men. So gender issues has been one of the um, great obstacles of my storytelling. And um, I'm trying to amend that by making an, ex an extra effort to get women to come walk along. It's difficult to do in conservative rural societies. Women just, you know, it's hard for them to break convention and get, you know, to get their families to agree to do it, um, to get their villages to agree to do it. But I have begun to um, get some women walking along in Saudi Arabia, which is a country that has a reputation for very kind of restrictive um, access to women. Uh, a young Saudi journalist walked along with me there uh, for a couple of days, and it was great. It was fantastic. She wrote a story about it. Um, in Israel, um, some, some Israeli women walked along with me. Um, and in Georgia, um, I had a couple women uh, join uh, the team. So I'm looking forward to um, getting more women involved uh, in places like India and China, big, big countries ahead. All right. Well, keep those questions coming in online to Twitter with the hashtag Let's Explore, and we'll definitely try to get to a couple more. For now, we'll jump to one of our live classrooms. Um, this is Sharp's group, grade 7 and 8 students joining us from New Liskard, Ontario, here in Canada. Uh, your microphone is on. Hi, Ontario. Hey, guys. Oh, good question. Another good one. A big question. What what inspires me not to give up? You know, um, a lot of things, but but let me just keep it down to um, maybe three. Uh, one is the amazing stories that I that I continue to stumble into as I kind of ramble across the surface of the earth. I'm continually surprised by all the serendipitous novelties that the life throws in my path as I walk around the world, things I don't expect. Um, and what does that mean? Number two, that's mainly people. The people I meet keep me going. They um, are often inspiring. Some of them are very um, poor, economically disadvantaged. Um, they might be farmers, they might be shepherds, but their lives are fascinating because they know a lot about their landscape. And so what I get to do as a reporter is not just write stories for you guys and for all of my readers, but I get to learn about their lives. So I would say the people I meet keep me going. And then the third one is you guys, my readers, and all the students who are following along. You guys, your enthusiasm, your curiosity about the world and about the project is a great source of energy for me. So I thank you for that. I thank everybody on this, on this interaction. Okay, another great question. These are these classrooms are on the ball, keeping you on your toes. Yep. Uh, let's meet our group joining us from Mexico today. We have Mrs. Zamora's group. They're in Tampico, Mexico, and they're a middle school group. Let me just make sure your microphone's on. Go ahead. 
Hola. Um, oh, hola. ¿Qué tal, Tampico? <laughs> um, I wonder how this journey has changed your perspective about, about humanity as a whole and how you think many different cultures and aspects of humanity coexist. Yeah. Good, good question. Buena pregunta. Um, for the benefit of all of us, I'll, I'll, I'll keep my answer in English. Um, the, um, you know, I went into this project with a pretty um, experienced background in, in foreign journalism. I had spent more than 10 years in Africa. I'd covered wars all over the place. I covered wars in Africa, in the Balkans. I covered Afghanistan. I covered Iraq. Um, and so I had a certain, you know, exposure to the world, to different cultures that goes back a long time, including being raised in Mexico, right? I was, I spent six years of my childhood in, uh, in uh, Jalisco State in, in central Mexico. Um, so I, I, I got to be honest, I think, you know, my perspective of, of what humanity is and, and what cultures are was pretty well formed before I took my first step out of Ethiopia in January 2013. Yet that said, and, and, that, and that, that perspective is globalist, right? Um, it's, 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 it's this notion that we all have much more in common with each other than, than what divides us, whether it's language or, or culture. Um, that said, walking through different cultures and different languages uh, in different countries over the last four years, the last 1,500, you know, uh, some days, um, has only reinforced the belief um, that there is no such thing as a foreigner, that there is no such thing as an alien. Um, one of the ironies of travel is that the more you travel, and I've traveled to, I, I don't know how many countries, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't count them, 50, 60, 70, is that the more you see of the world, the less important these things that that we essential that we think we travel for which is different landscapes the less important that becomes and the more important the human connection becomes and so um this walk has driven home the point that there is no exotic destination on earth that in fact the entire planet is home and that all you have to do is reach out for it and all you have to do is take that step out of your house uh, to claim it. Because guys, it's yours. Absolutely, absolutely. Good question and a, and a great answer. Our final group is here in Canada as well. Mr. Caverhill in Toronto, Ontario with his grade threes. You'll have to turn the mic on for me though. You're just off my screen. Okay, everyone wait. Hey guys. Hi. <laughs> hey. Good, good morning. Okay, hit me with your best question. How long have you been studying how people move around the world? Wow, good question. You're asking me how long have I done my homework? <laughs> okay, um, you know, I, I've got to say that um, I really started researching this project Uh, about the year before I started walking. So that would be 2012. So I started doing lots of, you know, interviews. I talked to scientists. I talked to anthropologists. I interviewed other journalists around the world. I, I read books. But the, the real, that, that's, that's an honest, true answer. But the more complicated but even truer answer, I think, is that I probably started when I was six years old because that's when my family uh, moved to another country and took me across my first international border. And even as, a, even as a kindergartner going into first grade, I began to specialize in my chosen career, which was storytelling about migration, about what makes us as people, as a species, so restless. Why can't we sit still? Like even you guys aren't sitting still and I'm not sitting still either. I'm kind of squirming in my chair Why are we filled with this restless energy to keep moving? Why do we always think, I wonder what's over the next horizon? Why do we go for walks in nature and delight in being surprised at seeing something new around the corner of a mountain or a stream? I think the, this deep, deep desire 
of feeling new things, of seeing new things, of experiencing new experiences is deeply embedded, deeply buried in our bones from the Stone Age era. I think we're all natural explorers. I think we're all, um, we all have this uh, yearning inside of us to, to discover new things, even if it's in our neighborhood. And I think um, that is the origin, the beginning of my own sort of specialization in studying human migration. Thank you. All right. So we've swung through each of our classrooms. Um, there's a classroom who sent some, uh, some, some uh, questions to us last night. There are sixth graders from Wheeler School in Providence, Rhode Island. I'm going to squeak two of theirs in. The first one is, how many shoes have you gone through? And the second okay. is, the best food you've eaten along the way. Great. Okay. Uh, shoes. I've gone through four or five pairs of, of, of hiking shoes. Um, and that doesn't sound like a lot. I'm surprised, actually. I thought I'd be wearing through more. Um, I get about 1,000 miles, about 1,600 kilometers out of each pair of new hiking shoes. So they're quite well made. Um, that's one of the great advantages of doing this project in the, in the day that we live in. I can take care of, I can, you know, I take advantage of high technology, including shoe design, um, to, to uh, help me get forward through the world. I would imagine if I were living 100 years ago, I would have worn through many, many pairs of sandals by now. So that's, that's one question. Um, and favorite foods, oh gosh, let me count the ways. I don't know if you guys would agree, but you know, you can eat even kind of bad food, but if it's in good company um, with people that you like and you're laughing a lot, it gives it a certain spice, a flavor that makes it taste good. So you know, I can tell you maybe not what my best food is, but I can tell you some amazing uh, meals that I've had. Um, um, I've had lots of fantastic meals with shepherds coming across Central Asia, living in huts out on the steppe, out on the grasslands. And the meal might be as simple as some fresh-made yogurt and some fresh-made bread with a cup of tea, but it, it was probably the best meal that I'd had in weeks. Um, walking through Turkey, um, through all of the um, small farms with fresh vegetables uh, was fantastic. I was able to experience turkey through my taste buds, right, which is another nerve ending we don't usually new use too often as we travel. Um, so food is a very important part of anybody's life. It's an important part of your guys' life. It's an important part of mine. And sharing food around a campfire or around a farmer's table um, or uh, even on the back of a, of a, of a camel um, is an important way to connect with people. It gets, it gets people talking about their lives over a meal. So uh, food is very important to my project. All right. I can only imagine some of the, the great stuff you've come across on this journey. That's pretty awesome. Indeed, it is, yeah. Uh, okay, so another Twitter question. Um, this one is from, let me just double check, a grade five class. Uh, from St. Benedict, and this comes from Regan. And so I think this is a follow-up to when you usually stay with people, but have you ever ended up having to stay kind of in the middle of nowhere, just sleeping on the ground? Yeah, Regan, I do. I don't know if you remember the, the, the picture that I showed of the desert um, when I was holding up that, that piece of pottery. Um, that was probably the most recent time a few months ago when I had to sleep out under the stars on the sand. And I have I carry a sleeping bag with me, and a piece of plastic. And uh, it's it's normally how I sleep when I'm out away from villages and towns and people. Um, occasionally, I carry a tent in places where there are insects, buying insects to keep the insects away. But most of the the walk out of Africa, when I camp out, has been under the open stars. All right, jump into my class in Guelph, Ontario. Sterling has a quick question for you. Have you ever been injured on your journey? Hi, Sterling. Yeah, I did. Um, I fell down a mountain in Georgia, the country of Georgia and the Caucasus in deep snow, and I injured my left knee. And the, the, the walking partners that I was walking with at the time had to help me. I had to put my arms around them, around their shoulders, and had to limp down the mountain and then see a doctor in the, in the capital city called Tbilisi. Um, I've walked off a cliff at night in Saudi Arabia and kind of did unintentional gymnastics, cartwheeling down this cliff into the desert um, and got cut up a little bit, but thankfully nothing serious. Um, so 
I guess I've been lucky so far in, in not having too many accidents. And I guess also luck of the draw for, for my genetics, my DNA. I inherited my, my, my maternal grandfather's phenotype, his body, which is kind of thin as a pin, but tougher than a two penny nail. I, I can take knocks pretty well. All right. Well, great questions coming in from our classrooms. Um, we are getting close to um, the time, but maybe we'll just visit one more classroom live. Um, it's hard to pick, but I'm going to look for some hands. Let's see if we see hands from a classroom. Oh, that one is definitely hands. So Mrs. Reed's group, I'm going to turn your microphone on. <laughs> there we go. Hey, guys. Good job. Okay, so what's the coolest like cultural trait or like thing that you've learned about a different culture? Hmm. Yes, again, yeah. there's so many. But off the top of my head, I'll tell you about this amazing uh, cultural communication tradition among the nomads of Ethiopia. And look for it. I encourage you to look for it online at, on the site. It's one of the first, you know, four or five stories in Ethiopia. Um, and it's called Dagu, um, where when two nomads walking across the desert meet each other. And imagine guys who are like wearing sandals, wearing kind of a, uh, like a, a cloth wrap around their waist and, and not much else. They might be carrying a gun. They might be carrying a Kalashnikov. Um, when they meet, they dagu, or as they say, they dagu dagu, which is there's this codified exchange of phrases, nomadic greetings um, that goes on for several minutes that to my ear sounds kind of like, um, like telegraph from 100 years ago. It's kind of like in Morse code. It's a staccato. It's, it's very broken up very fast. And what they're saying is, um, hi, Paul. And I say, hi. And they say, how's your, how's your, how's your wife? She's fine. How's your wife? She's fine. How's your grandmother? She's okay. How's your grandmother? She's doing great. How's your goat? My goats are doing, and it just goes on and on for like four or five minutes back and forth until after about you know, it seems like an eternity, they finally get to the point of what they wanted to talk about, which is, Paul, did you see my camel? Uh, it was lost over here two days ago. And just imagine um, this exchange of news happening over and over. And as I was walking through the Rift Valley of Africa, it would happen every single time that we stopped and met a stranger. And it was just uh, fascinating and strange because, you know, I was, it was, it would, it, until it became clear to me the purpose of it kind of culturally is an exchange of news. And what it does is it bonds the two speakers who might be strangers or, or kind of only distantly aware of each other. It bonds them at a personal level so that it creates a connection that makes it safe for them to roam around this open desert, right? It's, it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a conflict resolution mechanism as well as an exchange of news. So I've got to say that was pretty cool. And if you find that story, it has an audio and listen to it. You'll, sound, you'll, you'll see it sounds pretty amazing to see these two guys doing a dagu dagu back and forth. All right, well thank you to Ms. Reed's class for the enthusiasm and sneaking in that one last question. Um, before I put things back over to Jordan and Nat Geo, I'm going to share my screen one more time and I'm gonna share all the ways you can connect and follow along with the Out of Eden um, walk. So let me just share my screen. There we go. And there we go, one more time. So you can see all the different ways through social media to stay in touch. You can see um, email updates as well. There's an address down at the bottom. So lots of ways to stay in touch uh, and follow Paul's continuing uh, adventures as he continues following our, our migratory routes across our planet. Yep, great guys. Write, write to me too and, or communicate by social media. I, I try to answer um, all the questions I can, you know, just be patient, but I, I do, I do answer. It's been great hearing your questions today. Great questions. All right. So Jordan's going to pop back in from Nat Geo and then I will, uh, give the classrooms an opportunity to say goodbye and thank you. Yeah. Great. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a really incredible talk. I appreciate all the language that you're using and talking about empathy and storytelling. It's really important. And for educators watching that want to bring more of that side of stuff into their classroom, um, talking about stuff happening around the world and how you can kind of bring that into your own community and your own classroom, please check out natgeoed.org. We have lots of different materials. We're working hard to support educators 
the best we can. So please check our stuff out and join for another Explorer Classroom. The schedule is on our website at natgeoed.org. Um, and thanks to all the classes that joined today. Amazing questions. Back to Joe. All right, Jordan, thank you so much. Again, like Jordan says, thank you so much to the classrooms joining as well. We had lots of classrooms watching live uh, via YouTube. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for the great questions that were sent in. Paul, a pleasure again. I look forward to hopefully many more of these connections as you continue over the next few years sharing your story. Um, and good luck um, when you're back on the, on the hiking trail, on the roads. No, I look forward to it again, and I, I can't let the time or this occasion go by without also expressing my thanks, Joe, for Out of Eden Learn at Harvard and, and uh, the Pulitzer Center, two education partners. Uh, for, for educators who are interested in the project, take a look at their, their web pages. They're on the National Geographic site, as well as having their own, to you know, access curriculums and uh, learning platforms associated with this, this insanely long walk across the world, which is a lot of fun. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate talking to you. All right, and now I'm going to turn on the microphones to the classrooms and give you guys a chance to say goodbye and thank you. So here we go. Microphones are coming. All right, thank you everybody so much for another great Explore Classroom. Paul, thank you so much. We are logging off for today. Great. Goodbye, everybody. Till next time.